Thanks, Serena, and thanks again uh, to um, Yes Area Land Care for inviting all these people up here today to um, for us to all learn from. Um, I'm the last act, uh, so I don't know if it's the, the sort of the rock star who's the last one to come on, but I'm hoping um, that I'll uh, at least uh, get you to start questioning some of the things that um, you do and um, you can learn from some of the mistakes I've made. Um, the process I'm going to use today is most of the people have got very slick um, PowerPoints, so I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to show you a small um, DVD, which is my play story, put you in the picture, and for those who want to have a snooze, you can just have a little snooze then. And then I want you to wake up and start um, thinking and um, taking uh, some of the messages that we've got from today and put them into practice on your place. So, Andrew, can we do the... I meant to say, um, I meant to thank Felicity Sturgis, who was, who was up till three o'clock last night doing this, and um, I hadn't seen it till uh, just a second ago, and um, there's a few photographs here in there that are on what not to do, but I didn't tell her which ones. So hopefully if you saw a few there that had some um, degraded soils, that's uh, what I used to do, and, um, and there's some... Obviously, so there's some good shots here of um, what we're doing that's working well. Now, just to take a different approach, just to keep you awake, I bought a long plant. I'd like to introduce you to this plant. This sits outside our front door at uh, Gillamatong and um, I've watched it grow for the last 15 years. It's a, it's a crab apple that was planted in that pot. And it incorporates a lot of the things that we've been taught today. Um, as it's been slowly growing away, um, it receives all its energy from the sun for free. It receives most of its rainfall, it's on the edge of the veranda, um, it receives most of its water as rainfall for free. And the thing that started me thinking about where all the things are coming from is when you look at the amount of matter that's there above the soil pot and it hasn't sunken into the pot, if I was to chop that off and try and fit it into the pot, I couldn't do it. I'd in fact end up with two pots. So as um, most people have been talking about today, is all this bit up here has also come out of the air. The carb, the CO2 has gone into, um, now what did Christine say? Glucose. And, um, and that glucose has then been transferred into carbon in the timber or um, complex carbohydrates in the um, fruit and leaves. It all seems pretty obvious to me now, but it wasn't as I've been growing up and, and learning. And um, I, I think I'd, I'll, I'd like to just run through how I ended up here. When I first left school, I went back to um, Braidwood. We were in a wet year, and we always drove around the farm with uh, bog boards. And it was quite pleasant. I went off to university to study how to improve um, my farming techniques and uh, came back to the farm in the 1982 drought and uh, when I walked back onto the farm the topsoil was literally blowing away and we, we lost we calculated up to 10,000 years of soil blew away then we had a big rain event and um, we lost what wasn't blown away washed down into the to the uh, dams and my sister who's here today it was her wedding uh, a few weeks after that rain event and we were sent to try and uh, remove the half metre of rotting vegetation in the dam so um, the guests won't smelt out. I took my knowledge from, from um, university and thought, OK, well, let's try and turn this around. And the first thing I did was read P.A. Yeoman stuff and put contour rips across the country so that the water wouldn't rush off the land like it had during this drought. I also decided that uh, we would never let this happen again, let the land become so bare. 
we'd kept our stock on and we'd ended up at the end of the drought with old, worn out stock, no pasture and no soil. So the first process was to go about um, planting, new, planting pasture and um, I can see why Cole had a problem up here, you don't know what's happening. Um, is that okay? It's fine, it's yep. better now. Right. Um, so the first process was to go out and plough the soil and plant more pasture and all those sort of things. And in that process uh, of sitting behind the tractor, I was thinking, what am I trying to do here? And effectively, I'm trying to kill the grass. I said, okay. Do I need the plough to be down six inches to do that? No. So I started lifting the plough up until I got it to just under the, the root zone of the plant and I thought that was doing a great job of killing the grass. Um, a district agronomist in Braidwood at, at the time had told me that, um, or had shown me that most of the grasses that had survived from the drought were the native grasses, the microlina, the danthonia. And so on the next trip around I thought, well, hang on, I should, shouldn't be trying to kill this grass. So I lifted the plough up a little bit higher and, and left little ridges of microlina and patches in between where we sowed the new pasture. All these processes were starting to cost dollars. Unfortunately, this is not a money tree. This is a hundred of those up the back. This is a hundred dollar note that I sprayed some of um, Hamish Mackay's stuff on and made it a little bit bigger. <laughs> I can see a bloke up the back there writing down a note. Must get some of Hamish's stuff. <laughs> um, so there I was going around ploughing and, and, and trying to sow new pastures and thinking about was this the right way to go when along came a uh, uh, person, I was going to say a, a company name but I better not do that, a uh, person selling chemicals and he said, Martin, we've got the solution for you. You can maintain the structure of your soil. You can kill all these horrible weeds very quickly and you can start sowing the next day. And I thought, this is fantastic. So I went out and bought his product, spent more money, went and bought a spray rig and started spraying. And this was just magic. We could spray one day, sow the next day, and um, end up with an improved pasture. After a while of spraying and doing this, I'm thinking, maybe there's a better way and I can use less chemicals and so I started experimenting with reducing the amount of, um, of, of this knockdown herbicide that I was using and found that I could actually ma maintain my native grass and get rid of the weeds. I thought I was really on to a great thing here. With my, um, I went out and bought a, spent some more money and bought a caldo cedar and I could spray and sow and um, manipulate the grasses using these chemicals and I uh, thought I was doing such a great job I actually set up a, a business where I was going out and um, doing this on a, other people's properties. Then I read about how you could use some of these chemicals, MCP, AAMON and that, and change the structure of plants that would make them lift up and then you could put sheep in there and they'd eat them and so you could use less chemical and get rid of your weeds and I thought this was fantastic and um, so I'd spray paddocks and put the stock in there and at no stage did I stop and think these poor sheep are then wandering off with all this chemical in them and um, we were selling it to you as fat lambs. Um, luckily, before I got too carried away with this whole process, I'd been told by this chemical expert that one of the products I was using, once it hit the ground it became inert, I think was the word he used or that it stopped killing plants. Christine's enlightened me that um, this particular product, when it hits the ground, it actually kills everything. It changes from, from the product that kills the grass into a product that uh, is more similar to formaldehyde and kills everything. I was unaware of this, and so when I got it on my hands, I'd um, rub a bit of dirt on them, Bob's your uncle, and I'd keep on spraying. So luckily, before I'd got too carried away with this whole process, 
I poisoned myself badly and I blew up like um, the Michelin man. I had welts all over me. And in this state I um, had a friend of mine who I'd been going out to his property and using a new gadget I'd bought a, a rotor wiper to get rid of tussocks on his place. And he said, Martin, how, lo how much does it cost to sow a pasture? $240 a hectare. How long does it last? And I said, well, without set stocking technique, it lasts five to seven years. And then he asked me the big, big question, how long does it take to get your money back? And I said, never done the figures. And he said, I've just done them, it's 12, 10 to 12 years. And he used an expletive and I went, oh dear, that's not sounding very good. And um, I said, H, I just read in the paper that there's a guy doing holistic management talk in Goulburn. And this was 1994, I think. And so the two of us raced up to there and um, suddenly the light went on that all the techniques that I was using, even though I thought, and we all think, that we want to leave the land in a better state, and I, I'd, I'd la like everybody, or everybody who that's their goal, to put their hand up. Just make sure you're all awake. Mm, there's still half a few sleep down the back. So yes, we've all got this goal. We want to leave the land in a better state, but here I was poisoning, killing, destroying structure, doing just about everything that was not going to leave the land in a better state. Holistic management enlightened Rob and I to the fact that we could use the animals to start to fix our problem. We could use the animals to start to manipulate the pasture and to build soil and we've had that all today with people talking about how, how that can be done. So I, um, and being myself, I, I thought I knew what I was doing and I didn't go and do the $2,000 course that it used to be in those days. Rob did and he uh, put um, many, many um, fences across his property and started improving his pasture. He never had to ring, ring me up again to ask me to come and spray his weeds and his sheep were doing it for him. I unfortunately thought I knew what I was doing and I, I started cell grazing, which was putting large mobs of stock in and eating everything. Uh, luckily, after a couple of year, years, I realised that I was actually um, compounding the problems that we had I was compacting the soil and so I went and did, did a holistic management course and learned how to graze properly and so now we, we um, manage graze our pastures and as you would have seen in some of those photographs in the middle of the drought we've turned degraded pastures into some quite productive native pastures. Some of the big paradigm steps that um, I've had to go through is when you're a cattle breeder, you get a bit, a bit attached to your stock and you tend to be a bit focused on your stock. And the big ch change for me was having to sell everything when uh, I realised that I'd run out of grass. And it was quite a cathartic experience. And, uh, but once you've done it, you, you, you sort of feel much better and um, it's very scary. And it seems to always happen that as soon as I sell my stock, it rains the next day. But this has actually turned out to be a really good thing. You would have seen in one of those photographs there was a, a pasture of microlina. That came up three, week, three months after I'd sold all my stock. All the neighbours were going, ha, 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 you sold the stock, it's rained, we've got grass. Their paddocks hadn't recovered. Mine had recovered beautifully, went to seed, and I, um, there was a shot there of us harvesting that seed. Unfortunately, I only spent a week doing it. I went and hired a harvester and it seemed a lot of fun and we got a lot of seed. Uh, then I took a 100 kilo bag to the seed merchants and they gave me a cheque for $10,000. And I wished I'd kept going another couple of weeks. <laughs> so I learned... Tend to get good. So I learned um, that if you trust the system, you can still earn a lot of money from your farm and I didn't have to have my cattle there. Now the process I've gone through is, um, apart from everybody else today who's been my mentor, and I've uh, oops, tended to chase people who uh, I think I can learn from. 
and um, I drove all day one day from Byron Bay to, to Canberra to listen to Elaine Ingham that um, Martin Stapper had organised her to be there and we got there a bit early and um, I was wandering around and there was this lady there and I started chatting to her and she said, um, oh, where are you from? And I said, I've just over the hill but I've just driven 900 kilometres to get here because I'm really looking forward to speaking to Elaine. I want, want to learn from her. And she said, oh, really? That's great. And <laughs> then I realised, yes. <laughs> Likewise, um, um, Christine didn't know but I stalked her and sat next to her on a bus and so I managed to um, find out some information from her and, and she's uh, luckily been to my farm since and given me some tips. Now I'll just move this money tree over here. One of the other people I've had the fortune of meeting is Peter Andrews and um, he enlightened me to what we'd done on our property. Whoops. And um, Peter Hazel did this very well today. Of, so our property is a bit like that, rolling hills. Peter Andrews turns up and said, um, I could go and have a look at your farm. And I said, well, we don't have any floodplains. Anyhow, we got out there and I found out that we did have some floodplains, but they had some deeply incised erosion gullies up them. This erosion gully we know was created um, by man. You can tell that the floodplain was not created by the erosion gully because the banks were, are nearly flat. If any of you have read Peter's book, if it was a, a, a river system that built it up, the river is more high, uh, sorry, the banks of the river system are higher and then it runs away from the banks of the, the river and that's simple physics that the heavy material gets dropped first and the lighter material further away. My system's not like that, it's fairly flat and if you look at an aerial photograph you can see that it's nearly a straight line. So what happened is a bit like what my father did um, on some steeper country, um, a boggy meadow, farmer wants to plough it, puts a little drain in it and it cuts away till it's four metres deep. Most of the trees had been cut off Tillamatong as well. Um, my grandparents did buy it from the Makais actually. Um, back in the 50s and it had a few lovely old uh, trees that have been left in the landscape. Um, in the last 50 years those trees have, di have died and so we're left with a landscape that's got an erosion gully and dead trees. What was happening was that, um, particularly in the 82 drought, wind was blowing the soil away, water was washing the soil off the hills, and worst of all we had this very effective drainage system that was draining away all these nutrients that were running down. And another thing that I, I didn't think about till Peter pointed out to me is that with these deep incisions in the landscape, all the nutrients were, dry, were running sideways. So this was a hydrated boggy meadow before. It's now a dried bit of landscape that um, all the nutrients are running out and away. Our cities that are down on the coast um, used to be covered in forests and things like that but we bared them, built bare roads, built these big cities and we take the, what nutrients don't wash away here, we truck them to the cities and then what do they do with all that lovely nutrient? They race it into the sea. What Pete, is that five minutes? Excellent. No question time. Oh, crikey. What, what, Peter, <laughs> thanks. what Peter showed me is how the system used to work. And there were fish here, the birds would eat the fish, take them up the landscape, lots of trees. Um, rainfall used to fall on the land rather than out to the ocean. So the water would be falling back this way. And the nutrients were all heading inland, a little bit going it out. My boggy meadow was there without this erosion gully in it. I've um, been able to block mine up because I'm on a grade second order stream so don't try doing this until you talk to your CMA. Um, I've managed to plant lots of trees on the property and the thing I'm doing now is always thinking of 
trying to recycle nutrients. So because I've got better grass cover, as speakers have talked to today, we're getting greater infiltration. I'm lucky I've got a few neighbours higher up. They've got bare land, so they're sending some nutrients down into me. And uh, the soil's letting that soak back in. The plants down in the uh, wetlands are now getting harvested by insects, birds, yabbies and things like that and they're going back up the slope. Uh, the stock that we graze down here go back and sit up under the shade of a tree and get up and fertilise them. So the big change is um, that, oh, and, and this is now hydrated. And there was a photograph in there that you might have seen and it looked uh, darker down the bottom of the soil profile than higher up. That is actually was a shovel full of soil that we took near one of my weirs and so we've actually hydrated the floodplain now and the water's underneath where it can't evaporate. The only water going out of this system is through evapotranspiration. So we've got a, a, a healthy loop going, a healthy nutrient cycle and um, it's all looking much prettier that photograph there. Um, I think that's covering it all. Oh, there was one other little thing I wanted to do. I'll try and do it here. It was resilience in the landscape. I meet a lot of farming mates who are feeling a bit depressed that things are all going downhill. And the reason is because it has been going downhill. Each successive drought we've had, this is resilience up here in time along the bottom, has taken carbon out of the system, taken uh, biodiversity out of the system and we've dropped down to a new level. Then we've had a bit of a wet period and we've gone down again and likewise. I was thinking when I was thinking about doing tonight, today, some of these drops have also been created by ploughing, by spraying, by weeds, now, with the system that we're setting up now, each step is going up. We're building soil biology, we're building soil biodiversity, we're building plant biodiversity, and by understanding um, natural sequence farming, we're putting more water back into the system. So I think that the message I'm hoping that you'll take home is, one, leave this in the tree, and uh, two, that there are techniques that we've been seeing all today of how we can start building resilience back into the landscape, putting biodiversity back into the system and I think it's possible and I think it's exciting and I think farmers should be looked at as the solution rather than the cause of the problem. Thank you. Catchment Management Authority has to be notified. What, what do you have to do if you want to do any of the natural sequence farming? Do you want to just quickly mention some of that? Um, it's a very good point. It's, it's a sad thing, but the reality is that you can't go into, even though we created this erosion gully, if it's uh, a grade uh, two stream or above, or a second order stream or above, you can't go in there and do any sort of structure and try and repair it without getting a, um, permission. And I can tell you, we uh, put a tiny little structure in a system on, on my family property and we've got a $1.1 million fine hanging over our heads for doing so. And um, it's a pretty scary situation to be in. So go and see the authorities and um, they have come out to Jilamatong and said, Martin, apply and we'll give you permission. Because in, in some of the lower parts of Jilamatong, I get into a th third order stream and I can't do anything in the bottom of the creek without permission. What's a grade two stream? Um, go and see your CMA officer and they'll draw you the little blue lines. It's, it's literally, it's, a, it's where the blue lines are on a one to one hundred thousand uh, map. If you tell them to come back in six months time and you've proved that it's done quite a good job, do you reckon they'll lift that off? Uh, well, we're, we're arguing that one, uh, the soil used to, the, the creek wasn't there, two, um, these structures have been there for over a hundred years and I just repaired them. Um, so we're, we're hoping that um, they'll see sense. 
the, the, most of the, well, the creek on Jilimatong, for instance, used to be dry every summer. Now it's flowing water at the end of a very dry period, and the rain that I captured on Jilimatong in June 2007 is still trickling out. If I hadn't caught it, it would have gone out to sea. Uh, Talawa Dam overflowed in day five of that rain event. My system didn't fill up till day eight. So I'm still holding water back from two and a half years ago. And I think the regulations, most of them were written in 1912 and, and some of them were updated in 2000. But the regulations haven't caught up with the, with the science. I think probably people can flesh some of those things out too at the uh, Maloon Creek Field Day. Yes. That's, uh, and we'll flick that board back over so people have some queries about the work that they will do and probably should raise them then. And certainly raise them with the CMAs as they go. Martinoids has a beautiful property, even though it's in drought, um, you know, the grass is growing, so let's hope it repairs. And I'd like you all to thank Martinoids. <laughs>